Hello, and welcome to Partnering with Nature, Biophilic Cities webinar series. I'm Rebecca Fornaby, a research associate with the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia. Through this series, we'll hear from practitioners and researchers who are designing resilient and adaptive urban nature, engaging the public to protect and enhance their green infrastructure, and addressing environmental justice issues through research and on-the-ground projects. The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities. In the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched with partner cities spanning the globe from Phoenix, Arizona, to Singapore, to Wellington, New Zealand. To learn more about the project, visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and biophiliccities.org. Today we'll be hearing from Eric Schamberger and Tim McCallo. Eric is the Director of Environmental Sustainability at the City of Milwaukee, where he leads the Environmental Collaboration Office, or ECO for short. ECO was created by Mayor Tom Barrett to develop practical solutions that benefit Milwaukee's environment and economy. Eric developed the Milwaukee Energy Efficiency Program, Pace Financing Program, Milwaukee Better Buildings Challenge Program, and Share the City's Energy Reduction Team to reduce energy across city operations. Eric oversees implementation of ECO programs and the Refresh Milwaukee Sustainability Plan and leads ECO's involvement in national and global partnerships. Eric holds a Master's of Public Affairs degree from the University of Wisconsin and certificates in water technology and energy analysis and policy. Tim McCullough has been with ECO since 2010 and has been the homegrown project manager since 2013, where he reimagines the potential of vacant spaces for economic development, local food, biodiversity, placemaking, and neighborhood revitalization. Tim was the chief architect behind Mayor Tom Barrett's Homegrown Initiative, which was a top 20 finalist in the 2012-2013 Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge. Homegrown has received national recognition for its innovative, inclusive, and non-traditional approaches to green space development. A homegrown sustainable park was awarded Milwaukee's Best Public Space by LISC in 2015. Homegrown and its partners were the 2015 winner of the South by Southwest Eco Place Design Competition in the Urban Strategies category. Eric and Tim will speak for about 30 minutes and then answer a few questions about their work with Homegrown. Welcome, Eric and Tim. Thanks for having us. We're excited to uh, share our message about how we're working to be an eco city and how uh, our love for life and, and being a biophilic city fits into that. The title of our presentation today is Eco City Milwaukee, Restoring the Land and Celebrating the Water. Uh, Milwaukee is a amazing city on the coast of Lake Michigan. I would like to think of ourselves as being on the fresh coast. There's the east coast, the west coast, and the fresh coast. And so the Great Lakes are a huge part of our identity. And one thing we try to do uh, through, the, uh, through our programming is to restore the land and the water. Uh, Refresh Milwaukee is the name of our sustainability plan and guides our overall uh, efforts. Our work in becoming an eco city starts at the top. That's with Mayor Tom Barrett. And he has this quote that guides our work. Working together, we can make Milwaukee a world class eco city. And what that means is we are, again, restoring the land, celebrating the water, and charting it a vision for how cities can grow and develop in the 21st century that uh, not only is good for the environment, uh, but creates jobs and opportunities for the people that live here. These are just a few of the snapshots uh, of, of activities we have in the city. You see our bubbler bike share program, uh, a pumpkin patch that we did in, in the central city on one of our homegrown lots, uh, and, and green, green roofs, energy insulation projects, our wind turbine on the port of Milwaukee. So there's uh, lots of that's going on here in Milwaukee where we're really working to re-incorporate uh, nature into the urban fabric. The Environmental Collaboration Office, we take a, a multifaceted approach to sustainability, what I call the new triple bottom line. That's ecology, economy, and what I call eco-community. And it's really, the idea here is to show the interaction of uh, healthy ecosystems uh, that, that are so important to our economy and, and really, really you have to have both for a long-term success. You can, you can ignore one for a little while, but if you really want long-term sustained success, you have to focus on all of those uh, elements of sustainability and, uh, and that's what we really try to do as an office. So we take a long-term view of the environment 
but we always try to make sure that what we're doing is creating jobs for people and improving people's quality of life in the short term while setting us up for long-term success. So I think it's really important to think about the role cities play in sustainability. Uh, neighborhoods and cities are the context of communal life and shape behavior. Uh, a lot of times in sustainability office, people think about, well, how are we going to you know, change people's behavior? And I think one of the ways you can do that is by reshaping the urban environment itself. Uh, because people respond to the environment that you put around them. And that's one of the reasons we're so excited to be part of Biophilic Cities is because reincorporating nature into the urban fabric, we think, uh, is really in, will have a long-term effect on, on people's behavior and create a context for, for that communal life, uh, getting people out of their houses, reconnecting with their neighbors, and, uh, and really taking pride in, in the city that we have. Uh, Well-designed cities serve an economic function yet are affordable and pleasant to live in. So uh, the way cities are structured, they were the context of trade, they're the context of manufacturing, but to be sustainable, uh, we've got to get away from the paradigm of the past where people, the last, you know, maybe 50 years where people drive into jobs and then feel like they have to commute a long ways to get back to nature in their own backyard. And so one of the things that we're, we're working to do is um, again, add nature back to the urban fabric so people will enjoy living here uh, as well as working here. Uh, we really feel like w reducing waste in industrial processes and our energy systems and our food systems and consumer products saves money and protects the environment. So, uh, you know, when people tell me that, you know, we, we don't have enough money to do sustainability, I simply point to the amount of waste that we have and the things that hurt, uh, hurt our environment. And so our goal is to redirect, uh, to reduce the waste and redirect those funds to things that actually improve people's quality of life. Uh, and as I said, cities that incorporate nature into the urban fabric are more tranquil, they're more pleasant, and they're, uh, they're more healthy. And so uh, we, we just, we really believe that, and we think environmental sustainability is critical to the long-term success of not only Milwaukee, but, but cities globally. I mentioned Mayor Barrett is really the source of uh, leadership for us. Uh, and for the community at large. He's won numerous awards for his sustainability leadership. Uh, he's leading a, there's a huge downtown renaissance here that's, uh, we have plans to spread that prosperity out into the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, we have four eco-industrial districts in the city at various stages of development. We'll talk about some of those as we go forward. He's won not one, but two climate protection awards from his peers at the U.S. Conference of Mayors for what we've done on cutting energy use, won leadership in stormwater management, uh, we're supporting our manufacturing base of sustainability solutions, and sustainability is baked uh, into our, our core objectives as a city. And it's not just our office, but he's really appointed people throughout city government that value sustainability and, and really see it, the central importance uh, it plays uh, to vibrancy in cities. So our office in particular, as I said, is to make Milwaukee a world-class eco-city. Uh, we develop practical solutions that improve people's lives in the economy and the here and now while setting us up for long-term success in those natural ecosystems that are, that are so important. Uh, and again, we want to develop community and global partnerships. We really take that, that old saying about think global, act local. Uh, I take it to the next step. Think global, act local, partner global so we can work together and really make, make a huge impact. Uh, and again, we're, our job is to implement our award-winning programs, which will we'll touch on and our Refresh Milwaukee Sustainability Plan. Our sustainability plan uh, was done between 2012 and 2013 and involved lots of community and stakeholder input. So it, was, it bubbled up from the community and, and we worked to implement that across eight issue areas, buildings, energy, food systems, uh, human capital, land and urban ecosystems, uh, mobility, resource recovery, and water. And uh, so our job is to directly implement programs that, that benefit those things, but also to act as thought leaders and encourage other departments and, and partners in the community, both in academia and business and nonprofits, to uh, buy into that same vision. And I think we do that pretty well. Today, we'd like to focus particular attention on uh, our, our urban and uh, our land and urban ecosystems and the work we've done there through Homegrown, which ties into the food system as well and also uh, water. 
So this is the old paradigm. This is a shot of Milwaukee. Uh, this is the old paradigm of losing, using land and moving on. And I think cities across America uh, had this paradigm, or the businesses had it, where you know in the early part of the century they, they used the land, um, unwittingly polluted it, and frankly moved on. And it was hard to sell that land uh, after it had been polluted. And, and then so you see this in cities across the country where businesses uh, move out to the suburbs or, or overseas, and they leave uh, the public holding the bag with uh, polluted sites. Um, and that's not that's clearly not sustainable, both at a city level or a global level, for cities just to move further and further out, pollute the land, and move on. And uh, we, so we have to come up with new paradigms for restoring our cities. And that's exactly what we've done in our first eco-industrial district, the Menominee Valley, where that this is a, the same area, that picture I just showed, but it's been totally restored to attract businesses, but really emphasizing uh, nature as an asset to that area that it will attract businesses, but also connect neighbors, uh, residents, uh, to, to the businesses where they can work. So there's, we created over 1,300 jobs. There's a 60-acre stormwater park there. The buildings that are located there have sustainable design guidelines. And again, we've reconnected businesses and, and people there by looking at nature as, as an asset, not as just uh, you know a way to get rid of waste. So you know, in the old part of the middle part of the last century, businesses would just dump waste in the river and look at it as a way to, to uh, you know, get waste out of there. And now we're looking at rivers as an asset. You can see in the lower uh, right-hand corner, there's a person pushing in the river. I'll talk about that more. So it's a really remarkable covery of not just sustaining the environment, but restoring the environment to a more pristine condition. Uh, this is how we define our eco-industrial districts. They're former brownfield sites that have been redeveloped primarily for industrial uses. So we're not in the game of just you know making entertainment districts all over the place. We're really trying to uh, honor our manufacturing heritage and create industrial uses, but incorporating green infrastructure to manage stormwater, integrating the nearby neighborhoods so people can walk to work instead of having to take a car. Um, so we're working to pilot new technologies in those districts that can potentially be rolled out at a citywide scale. And then also attract sustainability businesses there. So the businesses we're trying to attract, we want them, ideally, to be in the business of providing sustainable uh, products for the future. And uh, we've got a lot of success in the Menominee Valley doing that. There's a, a manufacturer that makes components for wind turbines. There's environmental engineering companies, uh, all seeing the value of being in a sustainable eco-district. Uh, the Menominee Valley was the one that's furthest along, is pretty much done, but we have four other uh, districts as well, Century City, Reed Street Yards, and the Water Technology District, and then the latest one is our Harbor District, which was a catalytic project in our Refresh Milwaukee Sustainability Plan. Uh, this is an example of how we've reintegrated and used um, natural ecosystem services to support businesses. This is a bioretention facility in the Menominee Valley, so we centrally developed this. It's a, it's a quasi wetland to uh, manage stormwater on site. You can see the pedestrian and bike paths around it. But it was an attractor for businesses because instead of having to require each individual business to put their own stormwater management plan together, we said, look, we'll do that. You feed your stormwater into the centralized system, and we'll take care of that aspect of development for you, creating an amenity uh, in, in that area as well. So that's something that I think can be replicated all across the country. Uh, this, I, I mentioned reconnecting people to the places they work. So under the old model, the whole Menominee Valley was kind of uh, segmented off by rail lines, and obviously rail is an important way to ship goods, but it, it cut off neighbors from the land. And so it was very difficult to take a bike or, or walk back into the uh, where the jobs were. You can see an old pedestrian bridge that at some point in the upper photo that it had been taken away. So you know, over the last 50 years, it was very difficult for people to get into the valley. And one of the things the city did uh, was working with a group called the Menominee Valley Partners uh, was to reconnect in the neighborhoods by adding uh, pedestrian bridges, three pedestrian bridges, uh, across the Menominee River back into the valley. And so it's just a, a super way to get, to get reconnect those neighborhoods. And I can't take credit as an office for doing this. This was uh, before my time, but 
Again, the Menominee Valley Partners working with the Department of City Development and Public Works did a really fantastic job with this eco-industrial district. This is another example of connecting citizens to the area. The top photo there was this old pedestrian path that had been blocked off for, for decades and uh, the city re put a, a bike path to get down through that tunnel uh, back into the Menominee Valley. And it's really great because that uh, bike path leads to, in the neighborhood, there's a little mini eco neighborhood uh, springing up on Pierce Street there uh, with a lot of uh, businesses that are focused on sustainability. So uh, again, that, that neighborhood business connection is just uh, so important and uh, something I think we do really well here in Milwaukee. In biodiversity, you know, being a biophilic city, biodiversity is important. Uh, and we evaluate here in Milwaukee in a number of different ways. But again, here's a, a fellow who had pulled a, a fish out of that Menominee River. You'll see people uh, fly fishing in that river, um, you know, catching fish. And so it's a great recreational uh, amenity. And then the Hank Aaron State Trail runs all up and down uh, that river. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to talk about our uh, home run program. Tim? Hi, uh, this is Tim McCullough, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, it's uh, fun. I'm actually a zoologist by training, so it's a, it's a fun opportunity to get back to my roots. And I just want to talk about um, the mayor's homegrown program run out of the city eco office. Um, but first, a very quick analogy. Eric showed you a number of the um, river sheds that we have. Um, there are three rivers coming into Milwaukee, and um, and one of them is the Milwaukee River, which um, in 1995, uh, there's annual fish species counts done on the river. In 1995, there's only four species of fish in the Milwaukee River, and the most recent count had over 400. So it's an example of us taking care of our natural resources and actually um, increasing diversity in the river population, and such that uh, two weeks ago, I was four blocks from the heart of downtown on the Milwaukee River, and I looked at the river and there was a great blue heron uh, four blocks from downtown, and that's kind of symbolic of the type of job that we're doing here in the city. Um, talking about uh, home ground, um, it's an in initiative that started in um, really coming out of the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge uh, in 2012-2013. Um, it was quickly named one of the top 20 ideas. And it was homegrown as a concept of using city vacant lots, which are currently a liability to the city and the neighborhoods and the residents, and turning those into healthy green spaces, which provide multiple benefits across the city. Uh, homegrown was enacted in late 2013 and our target area is Milwaukee's um, very challenged north side where the vast majority of the vacant lots are located. And so that is our target area. And the way we operate in Homegrown, it is part of the city, but the vast majority of the funding actually comes from external sources via grants and donations. And we put together project-specific public-private partnerships that um, work with the incredibly deep and wide local food and urban agriculture community we have in Milwaukee. And Homegrown is playing upon that strength. Will Allen, the head of the internationally known organization called Growing Power, you may have heard of, um, has traveled the world uh, speaking the benefits of urban agriculture. And he, he calls Milwaukee the nation's urban ag capital. And we are playing upon that strength going forward. Over on the right, we have done over 30 sites to date, uh, encompassing, encompassing a much higher number of vacant lots. And we have converted those vacant lots into parks, orchards, gardens, urban farms. Um, we have revamped um, city ordinances to increase um, urban food production and recycling um, on city properties. And one of the results that's coming from this, our homegrown initiative and in creating these orchards and gardens and parks is we are creating biodiverse, safe, healthy gathering spaces in very challenged neighborhoods. And as a result, 
one of Homegrown's primary drivers is increased healthy food access via growing local food. But we're also getting the additional benefit of species biodiversity um, and increasing that in our urban environment. So in a way, actually, we're really um, increasing healthy food access for humans as well as animals through their homegrown process. And biodiversity is just another one of the benefits that um, we're receiving from uh, converting these vacant lots. Um, we're also uh, doing job creation. We're hiring locally from the neighborhood to do our projects. We're increasing access to healthy food. We're revitalizing na neighborhoods. And we have the wonderful benefit of increasing biodiversity. And the type of environment we're dealing with here is your classic urban environment, which is simply put a monoculture of grass and concrete. Um, our, our north side neighborhoods and our vacant lots, these few thousand vacant lots we have, uh, I don't have a picture, but uh, the mental picture is imagine just a a grass-covered space that formerly had a house. Um, it's mowed weekly, and it's absent of trees. So between concrete, asphalt, and grass, um, it's actually a pretty uh, starved environment for, for animal species. These neighborhoods also have little residential and commercial landscaping. If it is there, it's utilitarian at best. Um, the public parks are relatively distant from each other. So in short, there's really very few food sources for the birds, insects, and pollinators. And the pictures you see here, these nine pictures, these are all um, from our premier par park called Gillespie Park. And, and you can see the number of local uh, plants and uh, fruit trees, et cetera, that we have planted at this site. And you can literally see the difference crossing the street. Um, crossing from Gillespie Park, where you can sometimes hear the bees 10 feet away, to a vacant, empty, grassy, uh, vacant lot right across the street. Um, we are especially focusing in on um, pollinators this year, and um, Mayor Tom Barrett has taken the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, and one of our major initiatives this year is uh, is getting the word out to city residents about um, planting for bees, pollinators, etc. And we've got a social media campaign on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram that's doing that. Um, we're, we're giving away milk, weed seeds, and generally we're really trying to increase the awareness of pesticide use within the city and the detrimental effect that has on pollinators. And that's really just a short um, snapshot of our homegrown program. Uh, back to Eric. Yeah, I'd like to give a shout out to a, a, a nonprofit group that's been operating for a long time in Milwaukee, independently of the city, but they just do great work. It's called the Urban Ecology Center. Uh, they're an independent nonprofit, but I really like their view, which is to get the, they get students in nature so they care about nature. I think that's just so important that. If we want to raise the next generation to, to care about the big issues of climate change and uh, biodiversity and everything like that, we've got to get people in nature at a young age, a formative stage, uh, to get them to love it and care about it uh, at, a, at a heartfelt level, not just at a, at a data or intellectual level. So really like the work they do, the habitat restoration work they do. They have uh, an, they build an arboretum on the river. A museum of trees, so to speak, to, to educate people on different tree species. They got kids in the city uh, tapping trees for, for um, syrup, maple trees for syrup and, and the like. So I just, I really think they do a great job and it's a good model uh, for other cities as well. Uh, storm water is a huge issue for us. I think one of the things Milwaukee does really well is implementing green infrastructure uh, at, at a big scale. Uh, green infrastructure is, what I'm talking about, green roofs, bio swales, things like that to help us manage stormwater on site and, uh, and really use evapotranspiration through the plants as an eco service that we need to take advantage of to improve water quality, but also make us more resilient to climate change because 
uh, we did a, a analysis, and you know, over time, up to we added, as the city in the last century added more and more pavement and stuff. Almost 45 percent of the city is per, is impervious surface. So when it rains, and, and the rains are the climate change uh, run the risk of getting more severe. There's just not a lot of you know, place for the water to go. It, you know, it's just too expensive to keep building bigger and bigger pipes to handle bigger and bigger storms. Uh, and so green infrastructure is one of the strategies that, that we're real big into here, whether it's rain barrels on houses, uh, green roofs. You see a picture in the lower right there of our central library, where we have a green roof on our central library along with solar panels, bioswales in our streets. Um, we have a whole street uh, area called the Green Corridor on 6th Street, uh, where we, we showcase permeable pavements and plants, and it's a gathering space for farmers markets and the like. Uh, we have a gr Green Street Stormwater Management Plan, and the idea there is working with our Department of Public Works. Anytime we reconstruct a street, we're systematically evaluating it for the opportunity to put in green infrastructure so that green infrastructure becomes more of the norm uh, rather than the exception to the rule. We have a Milwaukee River Green Overlay District. It's a preservation district along the Milwaukee River to, again, manage stormwater and create a nature corridor for people to walk along. And uh, the revitalization of Bradford Beach uh, is also something that we're proud of. A little typo in the, in the presentation there. It's the revitalization of Bradford Beach. Uh, about 10 years ago, Bradford Beach was closed all the time. You had these, the health department posting signs that said, you know, danger, E. coli. Uh, there was weeds on the beach. People didn't play on it. And talk about that more in a little bit, but uh, it's using green infrastructure to manage stormwater around around cisterns or around outfalls that are on the beach. Uh, we cleaned up the beach and, and it's, a, it's an amazing place. People could go there all the time and celebrate nature on, on the beach. Um, one of our new initiatives going forward is becoming a water-centric uh, water city. And that's a new initiative we're launching, but again, we're trying to really celebrate our place um, on, the, on the water, on Lake Michigan, on our rivers. And, and there's a number of ways we're doing that. Uh, one is becoming a leader in water technology. There's a group here called the Water Council, and uh, they help align academia and, and startup businesses, align with the businesses that we already have in, in water pumps and meters and that kind of thing. And, and our goal is to be the global water hub where we are exporting technologies uh, around the world to help deal with global water challenges. Uh, we also have the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences and the Marquette University Water Law and Policy Initiative. So University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee has this fantastic program to study freshwater issues right on uh, right here at Lake Michigan. And one of the things that our office is working to do is to incorporate the research uh, they're doing there and try to link it to policy at the city level. So we're really implementing science-based science, science -based policy coming out of our outstanding universities to implement good policy uh, going forward. And then again, celebrating our water resources, including the lakes, rivers, and wetlands. We have a, another good nonprofit group called the Water Commons. You can see that middle picture there. They have this um, event where they got people down to the lakefront celebrating the water and creating some beautiful photographs and, and using light there and some really uh, candles to, 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 again, celebrate the water. And it's just a pleasure to work in a city where you have so many citizen groups who are effectively working with government uh, to implement the sustainable vision going forward. And then again, that picture of Bradford Beach, that's what it looks like now. And it's uh, really exciting. That, that beach, nobody used it 10 years ago. And now, USA Today named it the top, in the top three urban beaches in America. Think about that for a minute. We beat out Venice Beach and Waikiki Beach, according to readers who responded to their poll. So uh, very exciting uh, to, to see the restoration. And one of the reasons that beach was so important is I feel like water quality issues are so complex. There's, you know, any water body is going to have impairments, and it takes a lot to clean it up. But beaches are so important because that's where people are interacting with nature in a very fundamental, direct way. They're getting their, their feet and hands dirty and the playing in the sand and that kind of stuff. So we have to make our beaches fishable and swimmable if we're going to get them to care about the bigger issues of river health and things like that. 
So that concludes our presentation. Again, just to wrap it up, I mean, we are working to make Milwaukee a world-class eco-city. Biodiversity, incorporating nature into the urban fabric is, is a huge part of that. And, uh, and we're excited to you know, share our information with biophilic cities and then going forward learning what other cities are doing so we can apply it here as we go forward. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Tim and Eric. Um, we've got just a couple of questions for you. Um, first off, um, could you talk to us a little bit more about how the city collaborates with community partners? Uh, how we work with community partners? Yeah. So, yeah, so there's a lot of different ways. I mean, it's a, anytime you work with community partners, it's a little bit of give and take. I mean, sometimes they're taking it their own initiative. Sometimes we're seeking partners uh, for things. But collaboration, uh, we, they're so important. We renamed our office the Environmental Collaboration Office because there is no way four people in city government are going to trans make the transformative changes that we need. We have to collaborate with with community groups and uh, and make it. They've been great at, at helping get it done. So we you know we work together. We just sponsor events, uh, pull our collective resources in play. Uh, in some cases, we uh, you know we have partners directly implementing programs for us. But uh, you know, Tim has done a fantastic job with homegrown and collaborating with community groups. And, and let's be, to be frank, I mean, we have a, we have our challenges in Milwaukee. I don't want to sugarcoat any of this. We have social and economic challenges in Milwaukee. And uh, I'll let Tim talk a little bit more about how homegrown is providing purpose and meaning for people to improve our, our urban landscape. Yeah, simply uh, one great example of collaboration that, that really produced results um, on the north side last year was what we call the Partners for Places program. And that partnership was an ad hoc partnership of four local uh, philanthropics, um, the city partnering with Growing Power, um, a local landscape developer, the university, and um, two nonprofit organizations that had workforce development programs. And this partnership went ahead and built 20 parks and orchards last year in 2015 on city vacant lots working with 17 neighborhood sponsors. So that's that's an example of the public-private partnerships that go forward where we end up creating beautiful, green, healthy space. We're actually uh, creating economic development through through putting money back in, into this community, hiring local workers, and and keeping those dollars local and um, uh, many of our sites do have green infrastructure as well. So um, Northside residents are not only getting on-the-job training, they're getting on-the-job training in a growing um, niche field of green infrastructure construction and maintenance. Great. Well, that answers my uh, second question as well about how the city is reconciling um, the needs of economic development with ecological restoration. Um, so thank you both. Is there anywhere, if people were interested in learning more about um, this program, is there anywhere they should look? Any favorite resources that you guys have? Well, I think our website's great, milwaukee.gov slash eco. Uh, that provides an overview of our programs in, in all of our strategic areas. Uh, there's links to the homegrown program right there. There's links to our sustainability plan. Uh, we're fresh Milwaukee. We're very active on social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter. What's our, our What's our name for those? Um, on Twitter, we're at, at EcoCityMKE1. And you can find us on Facebook at either um, EcoCity Milwaukee or Homegrown Milwaukee as well. Great. The last thing I'd like to say about your, uh, your point about, about reconciling the short term with the long term, uh, there are, in many cities, there is a shortage of jobs for some parts of the community. But there's no shortage of work to be done in restoring our natural environment and our housing stock. And so we just try to be very creative in finding solutions that can uh, attract investment, uh, whether it be private or, or from philanthropic investment, to, to put people to work restoring our, our ecosystems and our, our built environment as well. So. Um, the environment and the economy, they, they go hand in hand. They're not mutually exclusive at all. And uh, we look forward to working 
continuing that, that mission and vision going forward. Okay, this has been great. Um, that concludes this Battlefield Cities webinar, Eco Cities of Milwaukee, Restoring the Land, Celebrating the Water. Um, thank you to everyone who watched, and thanks again, Tim and Eric. Thank you.